Thank you very much. You may be seated. Keep the standing for when you see Jesus. Uh Thank you for the leadership, for giving me the opportunity to share a few thoughts that have been on my heart. Before I do, my wife Gloria, right in the front seat here, uh, 66 years of marriage. That's working out there. I know the woos, the woos were very feminine. The woos came on very high pitched note. Men didn't say much, but the women understand. In the morning for our devotions, we have we read two two books, but one is a a, a short short read, very short. It's called One Minute Prayers by E.M. Bounds. <clears throat> and, and on April 10th, it had this reading. It's a one minute reading. Uh, it said, uh, the, wor- the verse was in Psalm 141, verse 2. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Psalm 141, uh, verse 2. Here's the Here's the text. The early Methodists had no heating in their churches. They said that the flame in the pew and the fire in the pulpit must be sufficient to keep them warm. I already lost some of you right now. And we today, this is E.M. Bounds, and we today need to have the live coal from God's altar in our hearts. The flame is not mental power or fleshly energy. It is the very being of the Spirit of God. Prayer ascends by fire. Flame gives prayer access as well as wings. It gives prayer acceptance as well as energy. And there is no incense without fire and no prayer without flame. Amen? That was the reading. You can't read too much of that, otherwise you'd be in total repentance all day. Where are we at? Where are we at with that one? Well, I'm here uh, with a word on my heart, and thank you again to the brothers who worked out the, uh, uh, the program to include us in the morning. Uh, my background is uh, Pentecostal. I was raised in New York City in a Pentecostal church. And by the way, coming up June 5th, two or three weeks, uh, you're going to have Pentecost Sunday. So I trust that what I say today might be relevant uh, in your pulpits, in your, in your way of thinking uh, coming up, because it is the, con- the work of the Holy Spirit is the confirmation, if you read it, that Jesus' sacrifice was accepted by his Father. He said, when I get there to my Father, I will send the Holy Spirit. And so 10 days after he ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit. And so we're grateful for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. My background, Pentecostal, and and I want to be uh, uh, radical. Now, now, uh, my, my word, put my word on up on the top there if you can. Uh, the the uh, uh, there it is. Uh, <clears throat> it matters what your spiritual DNA really is. Defining our Holy Spirit DNA, promise and purpose is what I want to talk about. The reason I say radical is that when I looked up the word radical, it said, here it is from from Webster's dictionary. Relating to or proceeding from a root. I thought radical was, you know, way out action going on, you know, uh, abnormal behavior. But this says radical definition, relating to or proceeding from a root, or, quote again, growing from the root. And it defines our qualities and our uniqueness. Wow. DNA, the genetic makeup, is in all living organisms. That's the definition uh, taken from some material in Webster's Dictionary. 
The reason I say that is that we have the idea that radical means crazy. We have the idea that radical, but radical is laying hold or, f or laying hold of the very purpose for which the root has been put in the ground. I gotta watch the time here. I got it up there, we watch it on that clock down there. What are we watching it on? Okay, I have Old Faithful right here to watch it. Okay. So I wanna talk to you uh, about all the things that are happening around. Like I said, I was raised uh, laying under the bench a Pentecostal church. I have seen uh, people uh, when we were called, uh, uh, you know, holy rollers. Uh, no, we were called first carpet beaters, carpet beaters. And then we got a little more holy and, and then the holy rollers. See? I have seen, I remember in our church one time when, when the Holy Spirit was moving, one person actually, uh, was, he had epilepsy, but in the service he just, he just fell down on the floor and he was just yelling and carrying on and, and, and people got around hovering, hovering as they always did in those days and, uh, and just you know, breathing right on him like that and suddenly he went, yeah! And they said, that's it, that's it! And then he said, you know, the woman who's standing on my hand, please get off my hand, he said. <clears throat> now, I can tell you so many wild stories. Wild, wild stories. But I am Pentecostal because I saw reality. I'm not convinced very easily. I hate to say that it's part of my New York makeup. You know, we don't believe too quickly. And so we have to look at it and examine it. But I have seen reality. Some of the things that have happened, it's, oh, this is happening, God's moving here. After a while, it all goes, it blows over. I'm not being unkind. And to the degree, the, to the degree that the cloud laid, laid some new ray, fresh rain on you, give God the glory for it. But really, the essence of what God wants to do is to dig a well. And sometimes we're waiting for a cloud. <clears throat> because when you have a well, you draw from the well. And he, he promised you a well, not a cloud. And so we're talking about, some are saying, I'm, pray, I'm praying for a wave. He didn't promise you a wave. He said, it's a well. And so we have to get our terminology and look where what he said that we might recognize that re where is revival coming from? Is it coming from a cloud? Is it coming from a new wave coming out in the ocean, building up somehow in, out there in, in, in Indonesia? Well, what's happening? God is doing something in our hearts, and the well has to be dug there, and, and so many things have come to, to stop up the well that God will do sometimes dynamite to get some of that stuff out of the way. So it matters. So the principles of interpretation. Let's get, get on with the message here. Give me the next slide here so I can go hermeneutics is really uh, the law that tells us how to establish or interpret the Bible and, and there is a there is a, a, a word a principle there that's called the law of first mention first mention the first time it's mentioned helps to establish its meaning I have to go back to that because I'm talking about radical coming from the root where is the root when we're talking about Holy Spirit people uh, I didn't say the root of charismatic people in the 70s. Thank God for that. Thank God for all the wonderful things he's done. But where is the root that God gave his Holy Spirit into this world that we might enjoy the use of his gifts to prepare a bride for the Son? That is the purpose of the whole thing. It's not even to, to in a sense, the, the, there are many levels of uh, reasons we do what we do but the final thing is that God might present to his son a bride and we might be brought in and, and at the marriage supper of the lamb and we shall ever be with him it's so far out that it's, it's, it's you know forget about Star Wars it's way beyond any of that stuff it's way beyond that stuff and so we go back to the meaning we have to go back to Acts 2.4 now, the first account, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, of course the Holy Spirit's working in the Old Testament, many things, but for the purpose to bring in a bride, this is where the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. The Apostle Peter 
looks at when he begins to preach. Now, therefore, all of the congregation that day, when he's looking at the thousands of people, we don't know how many were there, but 3,000 ultimately were saved. As he begins to preach, he says, uh, we, have to, we have to find the, the, the real basic uh, uh, tap root. That's the big root. And he went way back to Joel 2.28, and he quotes it, that in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons. And he begins to quote that in his message to the unbelievers. And when the Holy Spirit speaking through him, he pulled no punches. He put it straight to their faces that you are the ones that crucified him. And ultimately, there was an uprising. So I say that it's very important that uh, we today, as we go through this, this whole situation, be able to ask ourselves, as, as we are having church, we're doing church, is there anything that we can say in that church, this is that? That's my phrase. This that you see is that. Unless you can say that, you may be up in the, in the ozone somewhere. But radical means it's, 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 it's coming from the root. So there's a root somewhere. And the way back, of course, the Holy Spirit moving upon the face of the waters, the Holy Spirit working at all times. But when it comes to the New Testament, God has a new way of bringing in his bride. And so he begins with the, the scripture there in Acts 2.4. My, my way sometimes of seeing God work through the years has been a beautiful expression. Sometimes there's different things going on. Uh, people run if there's, if there's a fire, as as uh, as E. M. Bounds is saying. Uh, there's a fire in the pulpit. People are running. They want to hear what's there. I, I somehow feel like like we we, we get into a place that uh, uh, Romney from from uh, uh, Texas, Senator Romney, he, he had a business, and his business was taking other businesses that were failing. They were they were they were sinking. And as they were sinking, he would look them over. And he thought, hmm, if we get that, and the thing is worth, uh, you know, how many million dollars, and he get it for like uh, pennies on a dollar. He'd buy the whole business. And one of those businesses is Staples. That was a sinking ship. It was going down. And he says in his analysis of it, he says that he went into Staples while it was sinking, and he looked all around to see what were they doing that was not a part of who they really were. Did you get that? Maybe you lost. Maybe you lost that one. Uh, well, you know, and he kicked that out and that, and he went back to doing selling reams of paper and ink and so and brought it back together. You go now to a drugstore, you got to climb over beach chairs and beach balls and, uh, and, uh, and everything to get to the, the drugs in the back of the store. We used to call that the drug store. I can't, I have, when I go to say, oh, where are the drugs? Way in the back. Are you with me? Some years ago, we had John Wimber here to speak in our conference, the founder of Vineyard Fellowship. And he said that years ago he was, he was uh, involved in, uh, with a friend of his uh, that was Pentecostal. And, uh, and he said uh, his friend was talking about the things in the Bible and the signs and the wonders and everything. And finally he convinced John Wimber to go to church with him, to, the, to that church, Pentecostal church. And John went there and he sat there and watching, he's watching. And then finally, after a while, the service went on, and then someone stood up at the end and said, Amen. The service is over. And John said, I turned to my friend and said, When does the good stuff start? I mean, I can hear him say it today. When does the good stuff start? I think sometimes we need to ask ourselves, have we accumulated a lot of odds and ends, and it somehow... We had to say, when someone comes in, well, where are the drugs, you know? 
Well, they're in the back. I haven't found a drugstore where it's right in the front. No, no. You got to go through cards, or you got to go through all kinds of things, all kinds of things to get there, and finally in the back. And we, the church, have got to ask ourselves do we have all of these things that somehow ultimately were good at the time, but at this point have become a drag, and it has somehow compromised the message that we have. See, like I said, I, I've seen it all. I've been in all sorts. I, I've been in Catherine Kuhlman's meetings, Jack Cole's meeting, A. Allen meeting. I've, when you talk to the big boys, I have been there. In fact, we had Oral Roberts dedicate our, our, uh, our uh, uh, church in, in, in Nairobi. All of these things we have been involved with. But I still see the uniqueness of the Holy Spirit, the genuine thing. Let me say one more thing. I really haven't started yet, but I got to say one more thing. When we dedicated our church in, in, in Africa, uh, we had Oral Roberts, and he brought out the World Action Singers. He did a great job. He spoke very well, and we had a big crusade. When I heard he was going to have a crusade, I said, we'll have the, have the building ready by that time. And in nine months from nothing, we had the whole building ready. And it, it took every ounce of energy I had uh, to pull it off, but he did, and he dedicated the church. But while he was there, he said, we'd like to see a little scenery, especially the world action team. And so they, they went out, and we said, well, we have a a missionary in the Maasai. It happened to be one of ours, Eva Butler, the sister of the, the, the daughter of the founder of the school. And so I had, when she went out there, I, she's outside of Nairobi, about 75 miles, and so I had, I was able to arrange to get a little hut from the, from what we call the MOW, Ministry of Works, that bolts together. They said, we got an extra one, take it. So I went out and we set it up. It was 13 feet by 15 feet, corrugated iron, and we bolted it together. I put a few uh, cement slabs down and filled the gaps, and she was in business. <clears throat> so we said, we'll take you out there. So the team came out there, and Oral came out there, and they looked, and, and, and they went there, and they stood in front of this hut that was between two rocks right there. But the beautiful part, when, we, when I set it up, when you open that side of that, the big, big side, Kilimanjaro was right out there in front of you. That, to me, that was it. So I knew that. I knew. And so, so ultimately, of course, they, they built a hut there and built a, a real place. Anyway, listen to this. When all of those world action people doing their thing, they came and Oral said to Eva as she came out of this hut, 13 feet by 15. He said, do you live here? And she said, yeah, this is what God has provided. And we're doing in that group of singers, there was one girl that heard Eva. And she said, whatever she has, that's what I want. You hear me? I'll tell you her name. You see, sometimes we feel it's got to be, it's got to be some big, big. Uh, uh, we we confuse or conflate the supernatural with the spectacular. It's not always spectacular, but it is supernatural. And so, Charlene Harmon, not her name at that time. I don't. I forgot her maiden name. She said, I want that. And after everybody was gone, Charlene applied to Elam, and we met her and received her from here. She met her husband, and they've been serving in Africa for years. They're home right now and working with the Maasai and now working with Muslims. There was no, there was no, there was no fireworks. Are you listening to me? 
don't be don't be taken by the fireworks because when when that go don't 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 go out and watch a comet because when the comet goes it's gone it's great for a while learn to release the well that he put within you <clears throat> let's get to the reason i'm going to the root and i want to give you the root of what we are as a body number 1 it says that, no, let me give you one, I know, we've, I gotta give you one more thing. A farmer in Michigan went to Holland uh, because he was a, a tulip farmer and he wanted to go see the tulips. When he got there, he saw this big windmill just moving gracefully like that. He was, I've been to Holland, I've been, with, I've been there in Ashmir and seen, the, and seen these flowers, uh, beautiful, through, through Holland. Beautiful. When you got the red roses and you got a big white windmill, it's just like picturesque. So he decided to come back to the States and build one in his field. And he built it out there in a place. And, but the road getting there is bunty. When he got it all done, it would go. People would came and the kids would come to see it. And they were just so excited to come and see this windmill. The only one doing it, its thing. But then he watched the kids in the back of that station wagon with their fa faces against the window go there and, and it wasn't moving. He said, you know, they've driven all the way out here on the bumpy roads, the dirt, well, get out, and now no, no function. It's not, not, not working. I can't disappoint those kids. So he ran a little wire from the windmill to his house and a little motor in the, in the windmill. So when he'd go to his window, he'd look out the window, and there was the kids coming, and he'd click the switch, and the kids would go, whoa, awesome. That. But it wasn't the wind. We need to ask ourselves, what moves your windmill? I mean, we had to ask ourselves some questions here. I was ordained with the element 1957. And, and I've been with it, and I have no intention of leaving. Has it, has it always been uh, peaches and cream? No. But you understand that if you see reality, you stay there. You stay there. But it doesn't always work. Well, you get in a marriage, you got to stay. you got to stick it out. I don't know what the next generation is doing, but with our generation, it was for life. That's, that's what we learned. It was for life. Let's see if I can open this thing. Test my strength. Okay, let me give you four points. Remember, we're going back to the root. And I ask you the question in this thing, uh, how many of these signs do you see? Do you see any signs in your church that somehow or other it, it's... It's not genuine. Stay with the real. Don't try to make it happen. Don't cook it up. Let God be God. And in the end, God will get the glory. Because if you do two cents of it, you're going to take all the glory. And God cannot afford that. Number one, it says in the book of Acts, as we read that, Acts 2 and verse 1, that they were all together in one accord. Let's have that one up there. All, all one accord. Now, I want to read that for you myself. Now, that one accord is not, is not koinonia. Oh, no such thing. It's right, not there. Not there. It's going to happen. And the definition is homothologian. Compound word meaning to rush along in unison. The image, I'm, I'm quoting right out of the, uh, where I got it from, the image of musical, a musical, a number of Notes sounding while different, harmonizing in pitch and in tone. Many different instruments with different notes, but one sound. So now what it's talking about is not uniformity of instruments, but uniformity of sound. You don't have to be like me. God, thank God. My wife will say thank God for that. But everybody wants, we've got to all be like this. It's time to stand up. It's time to... We all got to do, we got to, we, we got, we got to laugh, we got to fall, we, we, all kind of things we got to do. We don't got to do anything. 
What we have to do, really, is to allow the Holy Spirit to produce through you the instrument that you are. And when he works the instrument and you sound like a violin, be happy with it. But I want it to be a trombone. You're not a trombone. Get over it. Well, I can go to trombone school. Yeah, that's it. It's still not going to work. Let God, whatever God plays through your life, let it be a sweet-smelling savor. Let it be a concert of praise to God. The idea is that it's in concert. It's harmonious. We got, we got, we got people in, in there that, that we're all playing the harmony, and then son, someone suddenly with a saxophone decides to, to, to play the, uh, the, the, the taps. You know what I mean? And, and suddenly it's all, it's, it's not in harmony with the whole thing. So the number one is the Holy Spirit brings harmony. Not one mind. One mind, I'm not, I don't think like you. But the mind there is meaning this word of accord. Number two, these are the ingredients in the root. Number two, <clears throat> and the Bible says, the sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind until it filled the house where they were sitting. The operative word, the key operative words are filled the house. Filled the house. Now, the now only analogy I have for this is air conditioning. Air conditioning. That is, no matter who comes into that house, well, he's an unbeliever. He's gay. She's a lesbian. They go through... I don't care who they are, when they come in that house, they feel the air conditioning of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says. It says that the sound was in that, I call that the corporate presence of the Holy Spirit in the house. It doesn't say, it, the, the reference here is the house. That's why you have the harmony of the number one, and now we're going into number two, which is the corporate Holy Spirit presence, and it's filling the house where everyone is. Uh, I'm, I've had some thyroid problems uh, while they couldn't find out what the problem was, and, and, I, and during the pandemic, I had to do everything on Zoom, and, and this is African-American doctor. I love him. I, I tell him, you know, and his name is Dr. Matthias. I asked him, how did you get to be the 13th apostle? Apostle, I asked him. He said, I don't know. Only God knows that, he says. And he said that while he was doing his internship in New York, he would walk down the streets, and when he went past, when David Wilkerson was there, starting Times Square Church, when David Wilkerson was there, he said, I just felt the presence of God. That's what he's telling me on Zoom. Of course, the, about three weeks ago, I got a chance to meet him face to face. I just hugged him. I said, yeah, we, you, we are in this thing. My wife said, you're always preaching to him when you see him. That's the problem. I said, well, we got we to gotta share work. We got to share information here. But, but the thing is, we, we, very, he said, then I would just go in, just sit. Why? Presence. Ask yourself, do they feel presence or do they feel pressure? Okay, I got to move on before. I, actually, it's a, there's a bulletproof glass right here. <laughs> I can develop all of these, but I want to limit my time right now. Number three. It says, there appeared to them, I'm quoting Acts 2, verse 3, there appeared to them divided tongues like as of fire, and it sat, here comes the operative word, 
sat on each head. This is called personal encounter. Now, I'm going to look at this a little bit because uh, uh, it was the, the prophet that said in Matthew 3.11 that when, 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 he, when, when he comes, he, talking about Jesus, when he comes, he'll baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. So in any baptism, you have to have three elements, three things in every You cannot have a baptism without three things. A candidate, a baptizer, and an element. Three things you must have. And so, well, who is the baptizer? It's not the pastor. It's Jesus. He baptizes you. And I'm quoting, I'm going back to the root. It's a little radical, I realize, a little, little radical, but going back to the root where it says, he will baptize. And, and I'm, I'm a little afraid that there's some people that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but, but by, by, by some other means, and therefore the fire never got on them. It wasn't the personal encounter with Jesus Christ himself, who really, that's where the action's at. Because when you're baptized by Jesus, Jesus becomes your whole life. Well, I've been baptized uh, in my denomination. Forget about it. Get baptized again. We need to ask God to help us that we're always introducing Jesus. And John spending his time saying, I'm really, I'm really not the man, but there is someone coming. And when he comes, he will baptize. He's the baptizer. The element is the Holy Spirit. And I am the candidate. Once you got those three things together, it blends it together so that I, I am in the Spirit and I am there because Jesus put me there. Each individual was touched by the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire always represents purity and power. Now, I have to stop, just drag my feet here a little. I am watching the church today, general out there. There's that first one, the, the harmony thing, to a degree. They're trying to get people to think the same way. They don't, 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 we don't have opposition. opposition You've got to leave, go somewhere else. We want the harmony. No, the harmony I'm talking about is the harmony of the Holy Spirit, where everybody is who they are, and yet we are all worshiping, and in the worship, it's harmonious. And then... The worship that goes on now is very powerful. Uh, I have the privilege of being down. And, and by the way, I meant to start by saying this, that this message God gave me about two months ago for Elam. But the next place I was going was to Mexico City. So I said, Lord, and the Lord said, that's Elam. So, so I went down to Mexico City, and I said, I have, to, I have to deliver this burden. i got to get it out. Because the worship there is phenomenal. And I was all geared up, went to the church, we got there, and my son and I were down, and, and, and I get to the church, I'm supposed to be, start at 10 o'clock, all the people, about 1,200 are out on the street, these are all pastors and leaders down there, what's happening, there's no, there's no lights, all dark in there, so I walked in with my cell phone light, that's a, that's a, that's a real, that's a God thing, isn't it? That, that flashlight. Well, somebody, someone used their head on that one. And I went in there to this room where they had to wait around, and there was one candle up there. Robbie Evans was there, and Patty, and beautiful people doing a job in a great spiritual sense. Great. And I sat there in the dark until I couldn't sit anymore. Because we were leaving at 3 o'clock, and we had, and it takes an hour to get to the airport, and we should be there at least an hour. So I need two or three hours, and now, I'm, now it's 11 o'clock. Uh, when, when Andreas came in, I said, Andreas, tell everybody to come in with their cell phone light and sit down. I am going to preach in the dark. So for the next 45 minutes, I poured out my heart on this message right here. 
on this message. <clears throat> now, you know, when you preach with an interpreter, it gives you a chance to think. That's a clue. See? That's a clue right there. So after you say something, you can think. But that guy, is, he's, he's doing his work. And God... <laughs> That's right. That's right. You 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 don't you got to listen to it afterwards to hear what you said. That's the key on that one. But really, really, uh, uh, they all came in, and and for the next forty five minutes through interpreter, I laid this on them. I was weeping. It was too much for me. Of course, I see where the church is going. And I'm all happy for the church. I'm glad, but, but I'm saying that those who know Pentecost know the power of the Holy Spirit. We know where the root is, and the, in the root is the DNA. And that's a, that's a radical thought. That's radical because it comes from the root. Now, we find ourselves nowadays with the great worship, beautiful, beautiful harmony, and then the worship, really good. My thing is, are, are we taking them to the next step where they have a personal... I'm not, gonna, I'm not judging anything, but I'm saying that because everybody is sitting there with their hands up, do, do they have a personal fire on the head, on each head experience? That, that's what was there. The key was, the first one was, the room was full, the house was full. This one is, you become full. personal encounter. Some years ago, David Edwards and I, I loved him so much. We worked together for so many years. You know, he's a great Bible teacher. He, he, he said to me something. I give it to you on this slide. Put that slide, the next slide up there, if you will. He said, never allow what God has blessed as a supplement to become an idle substitute. In other words, <clears throat> if, you, if you open your, your drugstore and you're selling drugs, and not much, so you add beach chairs, and, and now you add other things, and now you're selling uh, sports, sportswear and everything, and now the name is still drugstore, but pff, I have no idea what the drugs are. And sometimes the store gets blessed because now we got... Now we got beach chairs, and we got sportswear, and we, I, we sell shoes. We're doing it all now. But I'm asking, have we made an... Put that one back on again. Have we made an idol out of the substitute, out of the, of the supplement, and now it's become a substitute for the real thing? You know, I, I've been in services where... And I have led services. I remember being um, talking about some of the revivals over the last uh, 20 years. I was in a service, and they had the girl that, that brings the revival. They had her with us. We were in Buffalo. They had the girl sing, and then they did this. They, did, they just did the same thing over again. It was there, and then the man spoke, and at the end of the speaking, and this, this is called, this is a real revival. We went through that revival many years ago. And the man said, I, I'm going to invite you for, for God. When I say three, okay. Now I got something else going on here. And we were all sitting in a, in a, in a big, wide, open place with folding chairs. And he said, when I say three, not yet. You know, God is moving in. God wants to pour out his spirit. And when I, one, oh, hold it, hold it, hold it. You just wait. And held him back. When he said three, the chairs that I was sitting on, the whole crowd almost took me to the altar with them. The chairs all fell down, and they ran. because he gave them the signal to run. Now, excuse me. If that is revival, I really can't stay with it myself. If that offends you, I'm very sorry. I'm saying that if you preach the word and people give their lives to God... That is revival. That is revival. People find that the supplement works good as a substitute. And God says, I bless it as a supplement, but I will curse it as a substitute. Let's finish this up. One more step. <clears throat> 
The last step is, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. I'm in Acts 2 and verse 4. This is the root. The first thing is that there's a harmony of the Spirit. Harmon spirit thing. You've got, you got all kinds of things going on, but there's a harmony. There's a corporate presence of the Holy Spirit in the house. Then there is a personal encounter on each, it says each, not on the head, on each head, as my Bible says, each head. It means each one had a personal direct encounter with the Holy Spirit and the fire of the Holy Spirit where Jesus said, I will, where John said, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit with, with power and with fire. But this last one, I got to ask ourselves, is there anything happening in my church that lets people know that the Holy Ghost is here? Hallelujah. Pentecostals have always said speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> that is true. The initial evidence. And there's the, the big, one of the largest Pentecostal organizations in America said not only that, they said, they added a word. That was, that was the original, that, that uh, speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit. But the, the, this organization added the only initial evidence. Now, I can't say that. For me, it's very difficult to say that. And I know some other pastors that have great difficulty, even in that organization, that have difficulty saying that. Because the issue is, there was visible evidence. We're believing for speaking in tongues. Absolutely. We're not, we're not selling ourselves cheap on that. But, but, but I, I was raised in Pentecost. And I have seen people speak the same tongue every time and have a different interpretation for it. And I said, wow, how does that work? See? In other words... I'm just working you through who I am. Had I seen that and said, oh, that's, that's all nonsense. So it's all gibberish. I wouldn't be here today. But I saw reality. Through that, I saw reality. And I'll tell you where I saw it. So that they had the word, so that the Holy Spirit came and, and, and they came upon it and they did signs and wonders. Hallelujah. So now we're looking here, the visible expression, infilling of the Holy Spirit, and ultimately a whole new Holy Ghost lifestyle, which you'll see it in the next final step, which I'll just touch right there. The Holy Spirit lifestyle of interacting, where it says, and they, this is the end of the chapter, two, they had fellowship. That's the word. That's the word for koinonia. Not the accord. Accord is not the... It's, it's when we go through this Holy Spirit process that we come up with people who are in love with God and each other. That's what does it. Otherwise, we're taken up with all the differences. We're still seeing color and we're still seeing denomination. We're, we're seeing it all. But when your Holy Spirit is at work, you see beyond that. You see beyond that. So that there are certain things, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, as we see on this, on this, my, my notes there, the thing it does in the last step is infilling, the speaking in tongues is the initial evidence, I say, of a life that is prepared to move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that's just not about speaking in tongues. It's about learning how to yield and speak the word of the Lord and still be moved by the Holy Spirit so that now God is entrusting you with greater gifts, with greater influence, with a greater manifestation of his presence, growing you in the gifts of God. Speaking in tongues is very important, but it's just the baby step. It's the, it's the words that, that, like someone said, where was the church born? The church was born in the upper room. Hallelujah. And then when it was born, uh, God whacked it on the back, and it started speaking in tongues. And God said, it's alive. It's alive. It 
You still there? Hallelujah. Sometimes we need a whack on the back. Not and a bit on a low side, too. <clears throat> we saw we saw demons cast out in Africa. I saw people fall out under the power of the devil and the precious African brothers and sisters just come and lay their hands and sometimes the person would try that, hand, that light hand became a heavy hand until that person stood whole over and over again. Am I going to somehow doubt just because I saw somebody engineer the moving of the spirit or turn the windmill on by himself? Don't look at it. God is still real. I can't preach that thing. I have to go with what's real. And so it says, finally, they, they took the word. Let me just tell you the story. Well, we'll go with this here. The koinonia, the last one. A new way of life, a Holy Spirit life together. They gladly received the word, were baptized. When were they about? This is, the, this is over there in verse 40, 41 to 43. This is the lifestyle that comes out of these first four things. The harmony, the uh, corporate expression, the personal encounter, and then finally the evidence that, of that something has happened. The evidence was so real to those people, there were other businesses that wanted to buy it. Is there anything, has anybody, business come to you and want to buy something that you're doing in your church? So we have this here word. This koinonia is only possible by the Holy Spirit. Before the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, there were 12 disciples. After the day of Pentecost, there was a church. It was the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that brings the harmony, the presence, the personal experience, and the visible evidence. Final, the, whole, the final sign of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost all the way through that chapter was the ongoing daily fellowship of the believers. Holy Spirit has been sent into the world to prepare a bride for the Son. That's the ultimate. Not to build churches. Thank God for the church. I built too many things, buildings already. But the bride. That's, he loves that bride. In fact, sometimes I've told him, thank God you love her. I, I can't stand her right now. You chose her. <laughs> I'm not hitting on your bride, Lord. Years ago when I was about 14 or 15, <clears throat> my grandfather, who had a great influence on us, Pop Spencer and he were like two peas in a pod <clears throat> and in New York. We always were building. There was not a day that we were not building. Something. A house, a church, all kind of things. My grandfather, when he became a builder, he found out that there were some African-American churches that were struggling. They wanted a building. He said, if you do what I said, you can build your own building. And a number of buildings in Queens have been built by the brothers in the church with my grandfather's instructions. Beautiful churches. See, it's not about the building. It's about the relationship. Whether they be white brothers or black brothers or green, it doesn't make any difference. The Holy Spirit is the, is the, is the one that harmonizes all the instruments and keeps them all in key. And when somebody plays their divine instrument, whether it's a saxophone or a, or a, a, a tuba, whatever they're playing, and is not tuned by the Holy Spirit, out of tune. Stop. The conductor goes, that's it. Hold it. Uh, the tuba, please, could we have a, a C here, a C chord, a C, a C note, a tune, get tuned again. Stop the whole thing. Sometimes we're trying to do things with everybody on a different key, a different note, different. And so my grandfather, we were building the church, and working on the roof. <clears throat> now, uh, there was a woman in our church that was problematic. 
Uh, she wore a black uh, uh, baptismal gown like very uh, I think she had it made in the tent store and, and it was just there black down like that and, and when she came in to now we're there we're 15 16 years old so we, we're not we're not ignorant we see we see what's happening she would come in with her husband in the church and they would come up the aisle uh, up there, and they would always sit second row on this side every time. And her husband, and she was wild. But she came in. I saw her one time turn in her seat and grab her husband's tie, and he clearly couldn't breathe. And the men had to pour him apart and get him and get it, get his tie loose so he could breathe. You don't have to watch TV. You just go to church. <clears throat> When does the good stuff start? When does the good stuff start? And so my grandfather said to the Lord, we, we were, he's telling us everything. That's, if you want to disciple somebody, you have to tell them how you think. Jesus told his disciples how he thought, not just what he did. They saw what he did, but he told them how he thought. When you know how to think, you do what he does. <clears throat> Sometimes we just tell them how to do it. Just do what I tell you. They'll do it that time, but they have no idea how to do it again. You haven't taught him to think. So my grandfather said, Lord, I, that's my sheep. And so he took her, he took her and her husband to Jack Coe. I'm going I'm to name some big names. I mean, somebody who's just in the new, they might know. He took her to T.L. Osborne. He took her to A.A. A. Allen. And, and, uh, and uh, Kuhlman. Uh -huh. uh, what's her first name? Uh, Catherine. Catherine and Pittsburgh. And all of these people, she came up there, and they laid hands on her, and they prayed. Nothing. Nothing. <clears throat> still grabbing her husband's tie, still acting up in the church. My grandfather said, Lord, it hasn't happened. And the Lord said to him, this kind will take prayer and fasting. I'm talking reality now, okay? I'm not talking flash in the pan. That's why I am. Because my father friends became Baptists and Methodists, and that's all good. No problem. But if you look at our root, it has power in it. It has action. It has life in that thing. And it has evidence of that life. And so he began to fast. Now we're working on a roof. My brother and I and somebody else working. He's fasting one week. He's only, we know what he's eating. A little, a little orange juice and water. That was it. Okay. A little orange juice and water. And then, and then, then that would happen, be like that. And then... Uh, one more week. I mean, to us teenagers, you know, without one meal is huge sacrifice. But he went with. So now, now we got to the place where he's two weeks, and he's working on the roof. Now, when you're fasting and you stand up, you get a little bit woozy like that. Once we caught him falling off the roof because he stood up too fast. I'm telling you the whole story. Three weeks fasting. We know why we're believing with him, but we're not doing the fasting, that's for sure. But he had a word from God. And he fasted four weeks. By that time, we had taken a, a necktie and tied it around his pants so they wouldn't fall down to his ankles. Because he lost so much weight. And he just was, he was losing weight, terrible. This is a secret of dieting. Be spiritual. Four weeks. And we're watching him. We got, we got, we got an eye on it. 
praying. He said, this Sunday, the Lord said, is the time. Now, do you think that we would miss that service? Are you nuts or something? We went to that service. Our antennas were like, just going like this here. There's going to be action here. There's going to be action here. Nothing happened. The woman walked in after the, every, after the service started. She called attention to herself right into the second row, sat right there. And we're just having a little singing going on now. We're only there for one reason, actually. <laughs> we want to see the good stuff. Are you with me? I'm finished now. I'm, 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 I'm ending. But I want you to hear my heart. Because I've heard, I've seen all the things, wave of this and wave of that, and all of those things that come, they go. But he said, I'll put a well in you that will never go. It will be there forever. And we run after the wave, we run after the cloud, all the, it's all, receive whatever the cloud, but don't run after it. Because if you, if you take what God gave as a supplement and make it a substitute for his presence, ultimately it will fade and, and, and decay in your hand. There are people today that are talking about revival 50 years ago. That's all they know. God is working today. I see it. Went to that service and my grandfather was there and had a little song and then he stopped the whole thing. He wasn't a big preacher. He had been a contractor before, and he never lost the contracting. He, he came down off the platform, and he stood right here. Remember, she's the second row back. And he said to the folks, I just want to pray now. And he, he didn't touch her. He had the, the row. The first row was here, and she was in the second row. And he reached his hand out like that, and he said, in the name of Jesus, be healed and he cast out the demons and she screamed a big scream and she said I'm healed now I didn't tell you that when she came in the reason for the tent like dress that she had she had a tumor on her, on her side the size of a cantaloupe and she would come in holding holding that through the dress like this. It was like small cantaloupe. Big tumor. She said, I'm healed. And my grandfather said, uh, will the women please take her out into the bathroom and check, is that healed? They came back screaming. She's healed. She's healed. She's healed. She was totally, totally healed. I don't know how many years she lived, but then she took the New York phone book and started to call the A's. And every one, she said, I'm just calling to tell you Jesus loves you. That's how she will live the rest of her life. I don't know whether she got even out of Queens. <laughs> now listen to me. That's reality. I saw it, and I'm here today. Some of what I've seen is it's okay if you like that thing. That's good for you. But I don't do that stuff. I want to see God heal and touch lives. I want to see lives revolutionized for God. Revolutionized by God. I say to us of Elam, be radical. Let us go back to the root. The root says harmony in the spirit. It says corporate presence in the house. It says personal divine encounter for both power and purity. And it says a whole new lifestyle of healing and seeing God do on an everyday basis healing and miracles. Not because we have a big crusade but because it's part of our lifestyle. Hallelujah. I pray that we take these words. As, to me, it's been uh, sorry to take so much time with it, but I had to unload my heart. Uh, like I said, 
the last time I shared it, it was in the dark. So I had more light on the subject, so it took longer. I want you to bow your head with me in prayer. I want you to ask God, will we go the way of all the other people? Are we just people that the moment that something good comes up, <clears throat> we jump on that, land, on that bad way? That's where it's at. That's where it's at. Healing is the thing. New move. Now it's, for a while it was, you know, the Gaithers, and the next thing it was the Hillsong, and everybody's doing it. It's all good. No criticism for me. But for me, I have to have reality. I can't live with it. I have to know that in my life, there is that holy touch on my life for power and purity. I must know it. I must know it. I must, in our churches, say, Lord, I want to feel the air conditioning of your corporate presence. And even unbelievers come in, they kneel, they kneel. In your presence. Lord, I'm asking you for Elam and for all the fellowship that you are able to take this radical word which radiates not from Elam's roots, though it does come from Elam's roots, but it comes from the birth of the church where you identified both the purpose and the, the power of that root. Forgive us for filling our churches with beach chairs and everything else. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for trying to organize in such a way that you're organized right out of the picture. Help us, Lord Jesus. Let's ask him to help us. Let's ask him to help us. We need him desperately because the way things are going, it's the crowds moving another way. The crowd, but, but the Lord's saying to us, you're my people. He'll say it to anybody that's willing to listen to him. And I'm asking you as pastors and leaders to go back to this word and open the Bible to Acts 2. Say, Lord, I want to see it again. Don't pray that you want to see Finney's revival again. Don't, you're seeing, seeing you want to see the Toronto. Forget about all that. I want to see the root again. I want to see the unadulterated, uncluttered root. That's what I want to see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord. Where the church meets together and they, they minister to other with gifts of the Holy Spirit. They see healing as a common, ordinary thing. Not once in a lifetime. Become a way of life. Father, I ask you to forgive us for going outside in any way. We know that there's a root in the Methodist church, and, and they, are, they are fulfilling that root in some ways. There's one in the Baptist. There's one in the Presbyterian with Calvin. They all have their roots. But our root goes back to Acts 2 and verse 4. And the Holy Spirit fell on that group. And they were never the same again. Lord Jesus, right now, in these moments we have, I ask that you do surgery in our lives. Refocus our attention on what really matters. What really matters, Lord. What really matters. Refocus our attention on it, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We commit ourselves to be radical. Radical. Issuing from the root in a DNA that matters 
to all of us, Lord. Help us this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You've got to help us. We can't do this ourselves. We can't do it ourselves, Lord. We're believing for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit, but it's going to come because people have had a touch on their head of power and purity. We're done running after man or man's ways of doing things. Do whatever you want, Jesus. You're in charge. You're the head of the church. Forgive us for usurping your authority. Build your church. We thank you tonight, today, Lord. Help us, Lord Jesus. We're desperate for you, Lord. Help us as a fellowship. In Jesus' name.